It is celebrate recovery. So we want you to step into this new lifestyle and somewhat enjoy it. I know I'm telling you, you have to trust and be patient. It's going to be a while. But, you know, I just think of going to the gym. If somebody is just going to the gym because they've been told you got to lose weight or you got to do something else, and you go in there and you're miserable, you're never going to go back. And I think that's so true of recovery. Hey, I'm Brian, and I'd like to welcome you to our uh, recovery podcast uh, for Christ Church. And I'm the uh, recovery pastor here for Christ Church and lead Celebrate Recovery and oversee some other ministries throughout the church. And we're going to have a conversation today with uh, Dr. Neil Gray. And Neil, if you want to just go ahead and introduce yourself and give a little bit of your uh, background and kind of what you do every day. Yeah. Um I'm just real thankful to be here. My name is Neil Gray. I teach in the Counselor Education Program at Lenore Rhine University. I'm a licensed clinical mental health counselor, and um, I've got a background in drug and alcohol counseling. And I've been involved with Celebrate Recovery for about, I'd say, between 10 and 12 years now, and just really think it's a great um, ministry. We've got kind of a outline we're going to follow today, and uh, I think we'll just kind of dive right into it. Uh, Neil and Neil is going to be very, uh, I guess, uh, somewhat academic in, in what he shares, but he's also active in the recovery community with, with folks each and every day and uh, knows what 12-step meetings look like and, and really embraces the faith aspect of it. But what is a, a clinical definition of of recovery in the way that you would teach it before that let me throw out the content okay yeah yeah just in preparation everybody just to let you know the podcast today is we're going to talk about substance usage it's going to include discussion of potential triggers associated with usage and addiction so this may be topic may be difficult for some individuals so we just wanted to um, start and put that out there and then, yeah, so can I just jump in there? Jump in. Okay, so I took the definition from the National Institute of Drug Abuse. So I just kind of wanted to go through this slowly because one of the things I really thought about as we prepared today, listening to the first podcast with Rachel, the language or the terminology recovery management was put in there. So I kind of see if we do one of these or it's going to be over two weeks just to kind of talk about what recovery looks like. And I appreciate it um, in our meeting Friday night, Brian threw out one day at a time, keep coming back, it works It, it works if you work it, those kind of, I guess, platitudes. Mm-hmm. And I want to kind of tie that in to even as I talk about the definition here. So, and that's where we start, and that's why I say that, because it starts, th- so NIDA's definition of recovery is a process of change. So it's not overnight. And again, I like the CR statement, um, don't quit before the miracle happens. So just as we talk today, to talk about that, it's things aren't going to change necessarily overnight, but trust in the steps, trust in recovery. That's what we want to talk about. So that definition, a process of change through which people improve their health and wellness. So we're talking about a lifestyle change here that is going to improve your health and wellness over time. And and I'm going to keep going on with the definition. It talks about involved in this is going to help you be able to live a self-directed life. And in this, I think talking to the recovery community, we'd probably say a God-directed life. But so we'll keep going there. And then to strive to reach their potential. And one of our theories, um, existential counseling, has a term in it, and I use this definition, reaching your potential is becoming what you were meant to become. So recovery is going to help you become what you were meant to become. Um, And I'll just finish this out. Being in recovery is when those positive changes and values become part of a voluntary adopted lifestyle. 
a voluntary adopted lifestyle. And I thought of that first podcast with Rachel, and she talked about, as she took more and more ownership over her recovery, how success followed there. Recovery requires strategies, strategies, and that's what Brian and I will talk about these next session or next few sessions, for handling negative feelings and living a contributive lifestyle to others. Mm-hmm. So, And then just the last thing I was going to say there, just as, as we talk, this will probably encompass all of it. This is what we, want to, what we want people listening to this to step into, this lifestyle. So this is that channel, that road that it's going to lead us to God. So I'm going to talk about spirituality a little bit in this too because it touches in. But it's, it's this, I think it's what you talked about with one day at a time, keep coming back. It works if you work it. It's that lifestyle mm-hmm. of recovery. Uh, just hearing that, there's a few things that kind of just stand out uh, initially to me. And, you know, you said it's a process. So it's not going to happen overnight, and that's something that uh, we talk a lot about each week at Celebrate Recovery. And it's anytime you're working the steps, it is a process. So it's it's not overnight. Uh, and then the, the other word that stood out is voluntarily adopted lifestyle, mm. and that is actually uh, one of our principles in recovery. It's voluntarily submit to any and all changes God wants to make in my life and humbly ask him to re- remove my character defects. And I think that is just huge that, that there's those two little things that we talk about in a, in a faith based program is, is buried in the a clinical definition uh, mm-hmm. of re- what recovery is. And I think that's just huge there. So, uh, But you know, you see this each and every week, but what uh, what factors can can hinder your recovery uh, based on that definition? You know, it's a process of change yeah. through which people improve their health, wellness, and live self-directed lives and strive to reach yeah. their full potential. Well, I, I think, you know, it's this concept of hope over time. Mm-hmm. And in addiction, and I guess as we're talking about celebrate recovery, it could be anything. It just doesn't have to be substance usage. Mm -hmm. It could be shopping or gambling or any hurt habit or hang-up you want to present. But in the past, you know, a lot of times usage is associated with um, or when we were impatient or we're impulsive. Mm-hmm. So if I have an emotion of sadness, I want to stuff that down right away yeah. to move that out. So I would think that would be a hindrance that it's stepping into this is going to be a life change. This is not going to be overnight. But I would think, you know, right away you talked about it, that process of change is um, I've used in the past maybe when I was upset, happy, glad, you know, angry. And now we're learning to substitute other coping strategies for mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. But that's not going to be something we've done before. So, yeah. And, you know, you're, you're teaching, you know, college-level classes to, to folks that want to enter the counseling field. Uh, how many coming in initially— view recovery as a process as, as far as thinking that, hey, we got to go, or some think it instantly happens, or some really have no understanding of what it is. Uh, how do you convey that that part right there, which is really huge in any, any step program or anybody working recovery? How do you get them to understand that this is a process? Yeah. Well, I think that for future clinicians, that can... It happens a lot of ways. One, for us, we just have to deliver that information to them so they don't burn out, thinking when they see a client in a 50-minute session, it's going to be like something we see on TV where they leave and everything's better. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, when when I would teach the addiction class in the past, we would go through the 12 steps. So just knowing, again, letting them know this is a process. It's just not Mm -hmm. done overnight. So, 
But I, I mean, I really appreciate you asking that question too, because there's a lot of patience both ways. Patience, the provider needs to be patient, and the individual seeking help, whether it be from a sponsor or in therapy, needs to be patient. Yeah. What are some of the, uh, you know, we talked about it being a process. So, what are some of the strategies uh, that are real important just to be primary things in someone in recovery in their toolbox for, for navigating recovery each and every day? What, what are some of those strategies that could have for that? And what are some of the ones that you, you know, teach also? Yeah. So, I think. <clears throat> I, I don't know when we're gonna if we're gonna get into this more later, but just starting to have some awareness of factors associated with relapse. Mm-hmm. Do you want to start talking about yeah, relapse we go, now? We can go there. Okay. You know, when we talk about relapse, that's a period after you've had some abstinence or controlled use, and you be, you begin to use again. Mm-hmm. So, I just the question you asked. I just use a definition from one of the authors of one of our textbooks. He talks about relapses happening, being unplanned and triggered by stressful events. So I think that kind of fits in there. Mm -hmm. Start with individuals. If you're in recovery, to start to think about what your life looks like and being a little bit proactive in decisions you make because stressful events are going to happen in your life. And we also talk about seemingly unimportant decisions. It's not the boulders sometimes that take us down, but it's the grains of sand. Does that make sense? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. So I think just whether it would be in in counseling or with a sponsor, but just start to even, we were going to talk about this a little bit later, start or thinking about people, places, and things. What are your, I guess, landmines Mm -hmm. that you need to start thinking about. Now, proactively, I think getting a recovery team in place. Like here, it could be you go to CR one night, you start to get some, you start to exchange some phone numbers with people, information. You um, meet with them, talk to them on the phone, maybe start to get a sponsor. Or if it's AA or NA, start to get meetings, attend meetings during the week. And um, I think just going to a meeting or going to CR and going into a share group where you can just start to listen to other people and what recoveries look like to them Mm -hmm. and start to maybe connect with some people that have had successful, um, have had success in their recovery in their life. So I think that would be start to make out a plan of what you're going to do because you're going to... It's going to be a lifestyle change. If I'm an every Friday night, sit around, watch TV, and drink beer, I may need to do something else on Friday nights. I, na- I may need to get out and do s- engage in some different behaviors to attack my addiction. I, if I isolate, if I st- we were going to talk about shame a little, if I isolate due to shame, I may need to go to a meeting and talk about what's going on in my life. Mm-hmm. So one of our theories talks, it's reality therapy, which is really fit with drug and alcohol usage. It really fits. But it talks about just make a movement in another direction. And you know the insanity definition. Yeah. So you mentioned two big things there that we we talk a lot, a lot about, but it's people, places, and things. Uh, changing the people, places, and things. Uh, and if you know, change your Friday night if it's not conducive to recovery and get connected to a recovery meeting. But you also mentioned another word, uh, and if we could maybe talk on that just a minute, mm-hmm. but it's, the, it's isolation. Yeah. Uh, you know, we end up alone, and most of the time the folks that I see walk in uh, to a recovery meeting, it's uh, – they've been they're, – they're by themselves. They've uh, – you know, burn every bridge that they've had and every relationship they've had is, is wrecked and it's pretty much just uh, them and their hurts, habits, and hang-ups, as we like to say, is what they're left with, and that's, that's what gets them in the door. So how critical is it not 
not to isolate uh, during recovery? And then also how is it, what are some of the things uh, that isolation can, can cause? What can be detrimental to your recovery <clears throat> if you isolate? Yeah. And I even think about for myself, when I'm by myself and I just have myself, sometimes those thoughts are able to ruminate in my mind. And you just, you get stuck in those thoughts and you can't get out of them. And a lot of times what I do, we talk about thoughts leading to feelings. So if I'm thinking negatively, I'm going to start to feel bad. And if that's a trigger in the past for me to do something, I'm probably going to pick that up and use it. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I'm talking about isolation, but there's some positives of solitude. We may not talk about that today. So there's some positives of being by yourself. But when I isolate in... When I'm trying to continue discontinue a substance or a behavior, I think it's almost like white knuckling. I'll just and that's a term we used to use yeah. in recovery. I'm just mm-hmm. gonna get through this. I'm gonna be miserable, but mm-hmm. I'm gonna get through that. And that's the other piece, I think, to touch on to your question. It is celebrate recovery. Mm-hmm. So we want you to step into this new lifestyle <clears throat> and somewhat enjoy it. I know I'm telling you, you have to trust and be patient. It's going to be a while. But, you know, I just think of going to the gym. If somebody is just going to the gym because they've been told you got to lose weight or you got to do something else, and you go in there and you're miserable, you're never going to go back. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so true of recovery. And, and for some individuals, you know, you talk about people, places, and things, everybody they've ever been around has used. And so you're stepping in, you're meeting new people, and I think if you give it a chance, that are living this lifestyle, and you're just going to see just some incredible things that you hadn't seen before that you can have relationships with people without drugs and alcohol involved. Mm -hmm. I just think it's really incredible for that to happen. The other word, you just mentioned the word relationship. Uh, How valuable is relationships and recovery. Yeah, I th- and again, I don't know. <clears throat> I'm not tremendously versed in the history of AA, but I think about Dr. Bob and Bill W., and they started to get a group of individuals together. And I, I, I think there just is something of being with other people and being in a group. A group can be really powerful because you can sit back and watch what other people are doing. And you can learn about what their struggles are. You can learn about their successes. And then when you disclose, when you talk in group or to your sponsor and see they're not judging you, you're cared for. Because we talked about before, shame, you know, maybe this belief that I don't deserve recovery. I have no worth. But you step into a meeting you get around other people in recovery, and you see you're cared about as a human being. So I think it's just real powerful. It's just another step in that life change mm-hmm. to... Now, again, you got to take care of yourself. I'm not saying you have to be out seven nights a week. But to get around other people that are on the same path as you, it's just really, I think, important. That's a big step for folks to make, number one, walking in the door for the first yeah. time, but also walking in the door and then getting up and walking to a, a share group. Uh, there's a bunch of people sitting around in a, a circle staring at each other, and uh, then they start sharing. But what's the value in – because most people have in recovery have spent a whole lot more time building distrust with family members and everybody else than they have been in building trust, so it's natural – for them not to trust anybody, how does the the share group environment, you know, uh, cultivate trust, and what's the value of of that environment uh, and sharing in a group that that have been there might not have walked the exact same path, mm-hmm. but uh, similar paths. Well, I think um, that first podcast Rachel said, and I wrote this down. Her shame was broken down by trust. And again, I appreciate that first podcast, too. It it said it took her a little while. So I think as Brian and I are talking to you today, we're not saying this has to happen the first week. 
but just to keep coming back, it works if you work it. But if you're in group, you're starting to meet people, and people start to share about their struggles every week, you can move out of isolation because you can see, oh, they've got problems too. And they're talking about really serious stuff, and people are looking at them, making eye contact, caring about them when they leave. I can be, I, and this allows this movement for, for you towards authenticity, where you can talk about what's going on with you. Mm-hmm. You can disclose, connect with the group, and see that you're cared about as a human being. Um, so I would say that would be a big piece, but... It's that step of getting into a group. It is scary. We're not here to say it's easy, whether it's ANA or Celebrate Recovery or other types of uh, recovery formats. You know, even if you can just get in there the first week just to be practical, and as you go around, let's say there's five or six in your group, just if you could even just say your name Mm -hmm. and introduce yourself, I think that's a big start. And then listen, it may take you a few weeks to... um, to participate, to share, but they're not going to require you to do that. They're not going to stare at you and be like, you need to talk tonight, Neil. So there's that grace. Yeah, and I think that's, I mean, what you said there, and I I guess uh, Rachel did mention it in her her story, but the trust does help break down the shame, and uh, but also, you know, help shatter the shatter the distrust that had been there for so long. But, um, you know, you've sat in twelve. You've sat in share groups, and you've facilitated share groups. Is it obvious when you finally see the light bulb cut on with somebody? And I know from my experience leading groups, it, it it's pretty obvious to to see it uh, when it finally kind of like, well, okay, this isn't as bad as I thought, or when it starts to starts to help. Uh, how does that uh, how does that impact the rest of the group when you see that? I mean, it helps that you you see it helping others. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I think that's the power of a group Mm -hmm. is that when somebody shares and they talk about obstacles that they're going going through, you know, you connect with them and there's prayer at the end and you can pray, especially I'm talking about celebrate recovery. Mm -hmm. You can pray for them during the week so you're thinking about other people. But then if they come back, you're coming back and you see them you know, have some success with an obstacle, have some success in their recovery. Like we give chips out when they've had 30 days, yeah. and then somebody else say, how did you do it? And they talk about how they did it. That's hope for you. Mm-hmm. And I think, again, you share, and the next week you come, you know, you may think, oh, I said, did I really say that this week? And you come back the next week, and they're just so excited to see you. And I'll tell you, a lot of times when we share things, I mean this in a positive way, we think it's a lot worse than they do. They 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 forget about it because we move on from week to week. You know, I just I don't know. This is a side, but I, I listened to a podcast of um, priests talking about confessionals, and they said, you know, a lot of t- they laugh. The two or three priests in the pot, we forget what they t- what they talked about, what they confessed to us the mm-hmm. week before. But I think that's for us too. I've held on to this secret. And if I can release it into that group, we process it then, we talk about it, but then it shows me I can be authentic and humble with these people. I'm a person worthy of being loved mm-hmm. in this group. So I don't know if that gets to you. Yeah, right. no, that's a, it's authentic, healthy community. And, yeah. And the ability to come in and take the and mask And be real off with be, each other. And be real, absolutely. Uh, I think that, that that is huge, and that's, that's a big barrier to to overcome but once you can do that um that's when you can begin to see the little the little things happen and uh just being able to share and share openly uh, is there anything else you want to kind of add to that uh definition or anything else we kind of want to cover we, we kind of hit a few major uh topics there in it but uh we're going to probably dial that down in the, the coming episodes and get a little okay. more specific. But is there anything you want to add to thing, that definition? Going back to 
Well, we, we talked about relapse then, and then just going back to recovery in general, I had some stuff just to talk about spiritual growth. Would you yeah, want to do that go today? Let's, let's go ahead and throw that in. Again, I, um, I've really had some fun the past week looking into um, some of this stuff, and I, I, I've got a CR Bible, and I looked at the um, intro to that Celebrate Recovery Bible, and it the definition it gained, as we get to spiritual growth, the definition was this, this program is based on the Beatitudes of Jesus. So I wanted to get back to that. And goal to become Christ-like in our character. So I thought this spiritual growth, again, the 12 steps, CR, it's moving us to be more like Christ. And I just really think anytime you can see change in a person's life, it's just incredible. And I think this program, the 12 steps, the eight CR principles, whatever you focus on, that provides that opportunity for people. So I just, I wanted to just, again, just talk about that with spiritual growth a second. And I just, um, a book I have, it talks about why is recovery important? And it gives a um, quote from Bill W. First of all, we had to quit playing God. That's the first thing that we needed to do is to quit playing God. And I think about all of us, whether it's a substance addiction or I, I gossip or whatever it is, you know, life's exhausting if we're trying to control things and stop on our own. And no wonder addictions occur. Um, and then I, I took a quote, again, I think as we think about our growth and what we'll see, you asked me about sharing in group. I think this process of being in recovery, what we'll see over time, and what I've seen from individuals I know in recovery over the time. And that doesn't mean necessarily that our circumstances are always going to get better, right, Brian? Mm -hmm. But the people we become changes. So I, I, I like this book, Recovery, the Sacred Art by Rami Shapiro. Um, and he defines spiritual growth. And I think, and that's why I thought about spirituality and getting in group and talking, your life expands. So as you meet people in group, you, you develop relationships with people, your life expands. And he defines it as this capacity, ever-deepening capacity. And that attracts me because I want to have a deeper life. This ever-deepening capacity to embrace life, I'm going to throw out these terms, with justice. Well, if I'm focused only on myself, I'm not going to think about justice for other human beings. So with justice, compassion, curiosity, awe, and wonder, he uses the term serenity. So I thought of living the serenity prayer and health. So I just think about... You know, those definitions, if I'm hung over on a Saturday morning, this is an example, but what's that sunrise maybe I got? You know, it talks about awe and wonder. Just, wow, this is incredible to look at something like mm -hmm. that. So that's, that's a definition he gives of spiritual growth. And then he talks about these practices. And I know we're going to talk more about that in the second one. But these practices that free us from the delusion our life can be controlled. So that's the other piece of what we're doing with the 12 steps and in Celebrate Recovery. We're engaging in practices that are freeing, freeing us from this delusion that we can control life. Mm -hmm. Did you want to say something, Rejoin? No, no, you're good. I'm, you're, you're... And the last thing I just kind of, well, I had a couple other things I put there because it's so interesting. I just went back to the 12 step. We've had a spiritual awakening. That's what we want for people to have happen, right? And mm -hmm. celebrate, rec celebrate recovery, the spiritual awaken awakening. And as a result of working these steps in our relationship with God, and so what we want to do is take this message to other people that need the message. And this is the big one. I know somebody at CR says this every, way, every week. Practice these principles in all our affairs. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, again, this lifestyle change practicing these principles in all our affairs. Mm -hmm. So it could be I'm utilizing this in a conversation at work. I mean, maybe not talking about it, but thinking about that in a, maybe a difficult conversation I'm having at work. 
I want to practice these principles. Do I need to make amends with somebody at work? Has nothing to do with my usage. But our life, everything has to do with our life. Um, So I thought that. And then the other thing I thought about this, just the spiritual growth. So CR is based on the the Beatitudes. And then I looked at the history of Bill W. and Dr. Dr. Bob and how they used the Beatitudes. And, And I went back just to thinking about this is a program that's built on the sermon from Jesus of how to live your life. So pretty incredible. And I... I used a, a author that's been used at Christ Church throughout the years, and I've really connected with him, E. Stanley Jones. Mm-hmm. And he wrote a book on the Sermon on the Mount. And, a, and this would have been, he was living in India, I think. So this probably this question would have come up probably 100 years ago. But I really like this question. She said to him, I've now become a cre- Christian. What are you going to do with me? How does one act as a Christian? I would say that piece of the, you know, we've got the orthodoxy, our belief, but I think with CR and the 12 steps, we're talking about orthopraxy. Mm -hmm. How do we do it? I think is the 12 steps. It's so built on the Sermon on the Mount. I think this is a way to live out your faith. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's what a lot of people... When when we're coming in looking for recovery, you're you're looking for somebody to give you some instructions on, on how to walk through it, how to walk it, uh, and, and naturally how to do it. Uh, it's, uh, and we've both uh, and, and in this definition, you you said it's a process of change. Uh, it's not going to happen overnight, uh, but the steps are there and they do work if you work them and you work it. Uh, each and every day, uh, they might not work out on your time, but it certainly will work out on God's time, mm. and, and that does help give you the, the, uh, you know what what she was mentioning there, what you mentioned in that quote is you know what what's God going to do with me, uh, and, and that's one thing is recovery is you got to be all in, you can't be half in or, or half out, you got to be fully committed to it, and uh, for you to you know, help discern that will and direction that God has for your life. You've got to be all in for that to happen. You can't dance in between it. You can't have one foot on one side of the fence and one on the other. Mm -hmm. You've got to have both of them fully planted on the recovery side and be working it each and every day. And I think that's just, that's a huge thing. Uh, And getting connected to a healthy group uh, to begin that process of change, uh, to begin that process. So... And I think that leads us to a, a good little point to, to stop and come back for another episode. Uh, but I think we can talk a lot about triggers uh, in the next episode as far as what 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 triggers do in recovery and what they are, a definition, but there's different types of them. And uh, I think it would be very, real beneficial to come back for another episode episode and and discuss those if you're willing to do that so yeah okay cool well we will set that up and just uh be listening for the next episode and we'll have a full episode discussing uh the types of triggers and what triggers are and thank you for listening today thank you